Hello and welcome to Art Talk, the place where we agree to disagree, if we disagree at all. My today's guest, Mr. Peter Koenig, is an expert in money and our topic, the source. Hello, Peter. Welcome to our talk. Thank you, Rennie. Great to be on our talk. I'm very honored. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, it was very funny when I said, oh, I hope I get the greeting right. You said, well, uh, if it doesn't work, we'll integrate it into our, our talk. That should be the spirit of our conversation, free-flowing, uh, and we'll see where we go. I do have basically two directions to go. Uh, one will be that we talk about um, uh, what source is, what the principles are, and the other direction will be to discuss about uh, the ramification, what that means in real life. Um, but before, um, I'd like to say a few words to the uh, viewers about you, introducing you a little bit. Now, I got to know you, um, in context with your practically lifelong study of money, uh, during which you made also the discovery um, we are going to talk about, source. Um, but originally I met you uh, at a money seminar where you were the teacher, and one of the participants put it actually very nicely. She said, um, it says money on the outside, on the box, on the packaging, but it's actually consciousness inside. Um, and I quite agree with that. And of course, source has a lot to do, and we sometimes talk about source consciousness, has a lot to do with consciousness. Um, you have been an influence on the Reiki community, whether you know it or not, for with your money work and later with the source, as I hope that we will uh, discover as we go along. But first, um, you brought out a book with the beautiful title, The 30 Lies About Money. The 30 Lies About Money. In German, it, the title is even The 30 Brazen Lies About Money. Mm -hmm. And um, when I quickly looked into this uh, this morning, uh, there was a beautiful description and there are a few lies about your book, not about money, that's your domain, but um, descriptions about your book. And one lie is the following. Apparently, Pope John Paul II said, this book explains it, why God has gone bankrupt and we are still in business. We, the church, are still in business. And Dermot Fitzpatrick, a uh, Irish politician, said about you as the author, Peter Koenig, they should lock him up and throw away the key. Welcome, Peter Koenig. Thank you very much. And of course, you know who wrote those lies. Uh, no, tell me. Well, it was some guy um, called Peter Koenig. Ah. I've heard about him. <laughs> the origin of that really was that at the time I wrote my I wrote my book, I saw that everybody was all these authors were giving themselves were giving each other, patting each other on the back, like, you know, all running to Deepak Chopra and Deepak Chopra was giving acknowledgments to all the other authors and they were all giving acknowledgments back to him, all on the book covers. And I didn't like that somehow, so I thought, well, I'll write my own. Um, <laughs> so, so I thought as my book was 30 Lies, I would start writing, uh, writing my own acknowledgments on the back of what Peter, of what they didn't say. If you see, uh, if you read it carefully, it's what Pope John Paul didn't say. It's a lie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a lie. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that. I found it. I, thought I just have a bit of fun with that. And actually, you know, I kind of self published the book. Um, it was one of the earliest print on demand things called iUniverse. It was just a pioneering um, publishing, self publishing thing at the time. Um, but I, I almost got it published by one of the big publishers called Random House. And and when they saw this, they got really upset at this. <laughs> they said, you can't do this. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so that when they said no to me, I thought, well, now no, I'm definitely going to go ahead, yeah, and put this on the back. And so, yeah, that's the origin of that. Well, actually, you know, I was saying in the introduction that you had a great influence on in the Reiki community. Uh, I'm not sure many people realize oh, right. that. But I'm telling you a small anecdote just recently. Um, um, I, I posted one of the art talks on different uh, Facebook pages, and one of them um, wasn't sure whether they whether it, whether the the subject I discussed was um, uh, within the parameters of the page. So uh, of course I asked, why aren't you uh, releasing my art talk? And there was a bit of a back and forth. And it turns out that this was an admin who who was uncertain about it. And we discussed, and she had heard over a long circle of the source principle. And um, uh, we agreed that it wasn't her, the admin, who is the source, but another person, and that she would now consult that person to get the final mm -hmm. decision whether my art talk should be released or not. The uh, question, the answer is still pending. We shall see. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this, nice. is, this is more anecdotal. Uh, this is not uh, all that important, but there are some other incidents where actually entire organizations um, um, chose to restructure themselves. And they started to flourish in one case and in other cases. Uh, where I personally was involved, uh, we closed the organization. Yeah. So before we get into ramifications of the source principles, maybe we should speak a bit about what do you mean by source? Um, uh, how did we discover it? Uh, explain a little bit. The viewers know nothing about source. Okay. So um, the word source, uh, in terms of of uh, the way I'm using it, I'm using it as as a person and as a founder. And the first person and founder uh, that used it um, from my background in history was um, a, a sort of personal teacher in the 1980s that I had called Robert Hargrove. And, and I joined his organization, worked with him for seven years. And he always called himself the source of our organization. And I liked that term better than founder because it, it feel, felt to me more expressive of what a founder does. You know, founder sounded sort of technical, whereas a source um, gives an image of, you know, things like water or um, light or other things in nature. And I felt this was like a more, much more natural expression. So my use of the word um, particularly in, in, in the sense of what I call my source work, um, has been always related to a person who is the founder of an initiative. Now, um, the word, of course, has been used in many different senses, and it has different meanings for different people. And I sometimes refer to, you know, source of an initiative, an outer project. But I also say that, it, you know, some people refer it to something like God, um, and that's okay. I refer also to the inner source that one has, uh, one's inner connection to the universe, or I guess um, the universal field which might be another expression for what you refer to in Reiki. So, so there's, there's this inner connection to source. And when, when people are realizing their projects really well as source persons, who I refer to as sources, they're usually in contact with something related to this inner source or field. So that would be my general description. Yes. Um... But not so fast, uh, maybe. I heard in the latter part of what you just said um, that inner inspirational uh, connection to maybe a deeper wisdom or something like that. <clears throat> but at the beginning, you spoke about 
uh, you use the term source almost synonymous with with founder almost yeah. uh, i realize yeah but one of the problems I had, you know, I've been co-founder of organizations, of breaking the organizations, of a number of them. And um, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat. I'm, uh, uh, or I believe in the Swiss concept of democracy, at least direct democracy, let's put it that way. And I believe in shared responsibility, uh, flat hierarchies, uh, shared responsibilities. And here you come and you're making you're making um, one person basically um, uh, 20 co-founders of uh, 20 of us uh, founded um, maybe one of the most important modern Reiki associations in Europe, the German Reiki um, uh, association. And we considered each other all equal, but you're basically suggesting that there is one single individual isn't that right? So y you are all equal in terms of being able to take, to be able to initiate an initiative or initiatives. So everybody is equal in the potential to form an initiative or to start an initiative. But if you look in detail at each initiative, um, there's one person that actually starts it always so there aren't 20 people that all start something at the same time um so uh one of the first source pe principle is that there's an order in any initiative and so many people may come to, around a table with a similar kind of idea these ideas are never identical even if they look and sound as if they're a bit identical, but they're never completely identical. Which is part of the problem. In this, this is part of the problem. But if you look carefully, if you study more carefully, there is no exception. It, an initiative starts when the first person says something like, I'm going to do this. Would you like to join me? Or, you know, the first person make, invites the others or says something where it's obvious that they are, they're going to do it, they're going to start it. And that is the person who I call uh, the founder or the source of the initiative. And identifying that person, I found is, you know, uh, is extremely important. Um, and it's not to, this is not to deny the importance of everybody else in the, the other 19. It's just that they have a different role. And once one starts defining the roles, one and and the order the thing the the initiative um can can flow smoothly yeah actually you know my uh, s summer literature was actually this little book about uh, the source uh, um, and uh, I found, I, of course, know the principles for a long time. I work by them and I implement them in my life and in my dealings, but I found a lot of inspiration in the book. Um, and it, uh, I re remembered my challenges I had, and the book brought this to the surface, when I first encountered uh, the thought. Um, like you said, there are 20 people, they assume that they're basically pulling all in the same direction, and they are, uh, but each of them has its own ideas. That, to me, was quite a bit of a revelation. And the other revelation was to, and it was a liberating one too, to come to terms with the fact that there is one source. And the interesting thing to me was that it empowered me even when I was not the source. And very often in organizations, it's the managing director, in association, it's the elected president, the, the visible, visible face on the front cover, so to speak, uh, where everybody believes or projects onto them, and often they believe themselves, that they are basically what you described the source, but very often they are not. And that creates a tremendous uh, suffering. Um, can you share a little bit about that? Yes. I mean, the, the role of the source is actually to receive um, a vision 
of the initiative then to you know to found the initiative and the roles are very simple it's to define you know simple to describe define the next steps for the whole initiative and communicate them to the other people in the team or what i call their field the people working in their field and to to um, define the boundaries of this field what's in the initiative and what's not in the initiative and this is a this is a full time job but it's not an operational job so very often uh, in many instances not always but in many instances uh, it tends to be the source tends to be more of an introverted role and very often the people themselves who are sources are introverts now what's also needed though to realize the project is somebody who's operational um, and they're very often more extroverted and more visible so there can often be confusion here because the you know like the md <laughs> the managing director and the communicator is out there very often better able to communicate to third parties about the vision of the source than the, than the source themselves uh, to bring across what the whole project is about so unless you look at it with this kind of special lens what i call it like a source lens if you look at it from a conventional and organizational from a conventional point of view you may miss who is really the what i'm calling the source of the initiative and the role they're playing um and only see the the persons who are really you know active in the operations and may and you may um, make a mis mistake about this who is really what I'm calling the source and the source I mean is everybody's playing an important role but it's important to know which role and you referred to democracy at the beginning um, the the ideal that everybody wants with flat hierarchies etc uh, this is the paradox it can only be realized when you real when you acknowledge this the order of source so democracies that work instinctively follow the this natural what i'm calling this natural order order um, and then they work and actually when they work you think that nobody's in charge you don't see the source it's like lao tzu said when um, when the good leader's work is done, the people turn to each other and say, we did it ourselves. Um, <laughs> but actually behind the scenes, or, or really active, because this is a very active role being the source, there is somebody there who's holding the whole thing, who's holding the whole field uh, with responsibility, um, with authority, and when it's necessary, we'll say we go left, we go right, um, and knows exactly what needs to happen next. Yeah, and I think this inspirational uh, fountain, uh, which provides for um, guidance to go left and right, if it is somewhere in the background, and if there is no consciousness about this process, such a person is then often seen as manipulative in the background, as a, a gray eminence uh, hidden somewhere. Um, uh, conspiracies might stem from all of that. But if there is clarity about it, then, and that's what I meant when I said it's so uh, immensely liberating when the clarity comes. So, um, the organization uh, which we closed, which was called Rio, I was the elected president and um, we had great difficulties um, in the unfolding uh, of this organization. And that's actually the reason why we came to your um, source seminar to find solutions from outside. I know that you have had uh, contact with Reiki in your uh, earlier years in the 80s, 90s. So, but we were looking actually for input from without the Reiki community and we ended up in your uh, seminar. And I remember I was the elected president and um, uh, character responsibility and 
discovering that indeed I was not the source at all yeah. of the organization <laughs> was just mind blowing. And first of all, um, it turned out it is my wife who is the source of the organization. So um, that, and I remember that uh, uh, like it was yesterday, I, it blurted out of me that I said, what does that make me? Am I her water carrier? Mm -hmm. um, so, so at the first moment, this was, and I know how much she had suffered in the background, not being able to, her source was like blocked um, mm -hmm. because there was no contact. And I, it, it was even paradox to the point that I tried to protect her from difficult decision taking processes, not to get her upset, my wife upset, not. The, the person within the, yeah. within the organization. And of course, the more I kept it for myself, the more she was locked out. And, and paradoxically, the answer would have been there at the fingertips all along. So when we discovered this, it was incredibly liberating. Yeah. Um, and eventually, of course, it turned also um, uh, to a handover, a succession of- Yeah, I remember, yeah. Uh, the sources. Yeah. Um, so I imagine that many, many people who are secretly the source and who are facing this lack of recognition, uh, that, they're, that it's incredibly painful for them. Well, it's incredibly painful, but of course they are responsible for it. Um, so one of the aspects of source is that the source is responsible for everything that happens in their field. So, you know, this is difficult for some people to take, particularly if you know, their problems in what they have initiated to, to see that everything, everything that's happening in their field comes back to them. And I refer this to myself, of course, in all my own creations. I mean, life um, will mirror back to you um, what you have initiated in your life. <laughs> so, so if there are problems uh, that you are finding in in your projects and your initiatives, it, it, it is something to do with you and your own development. And unless you work on that, um, you're not going to be able to resolve the problems. It's not the other people in your field who have the problems, it's you <laughs> to start off with. And so you've got to work on yourself. And when you work on yourself, what happens is that you will be attracting different people to your field and and repelling different people to your field so um so you resolve the problems that way but it doesn't work by projecting on the people that you have attracted and saying you've got to resolve this uh, because you've got a problem the problem actually always goes back to the source so this is the one of the big challenges yeah, and here we are on that second segment of our talk today, uh, impact and ramifications. And um, as you know, um, the R in our talk does not only stand for Reiki, but also for reconciliation. Yeah. And uh, you're just touching on a, an important subject because in the process of uh, reconciliation, um, what you just described is an important element uh, because all too easily we blame the other person for uh, something which has gone wrong. It's the easy way out and it's all the more painful to truly reflect what is my own part in the process uh, which has caused dissonance or, or disharmony. Um, when you work with people on, on the source, maybe you can... Uh, um, tell the viewers a little bit. Uh, you just said that one has the source um, has to then do his or her own work. What does that exactly mean? What do you mean by that? And it somehow shingles a little bit in my background because um, uh, when I did the money seminar with you, yeah. you also looked at this uh, discrepancy between polarities and, and taking ownership yeah. of one's own responsibility. Expand a little bit on that, please, Peter. So, um, 
so this this actually relates back to what I discovered in in looking at the relationship to money and what I call the money work, which I've been doing for over 30 years, um, in terms of helping people with their relationship to money. But as you mentioned in, in the introduction, it relates to helping to, to, to developing oneself in relation to all aspects of life. The little tool I developed can be used for every aspect of life that one, where one wants to develop oneself. And, and in this case, your question is related to developing oneself as source to resolve um, particular problems that may be coming up in one's field, uh, where one is sought, which one is source of. Now, uh, to answer your question, what I discovered was that the problems arise because there are part of aspects of oneself as a human being which one has dissociated from and when one dissociates oneself from a particular part it is natural to be upset when one sees this part actually being played out by somebody else so one will do what i'm calling project uh, something which is actually inside oneself onto someone else and say this person for example um, if another person is like arrogant um, you and you don't enjoy being arrogant yourself you will think being arrogant is bad and you will dissociate yourself from all the people that you find in the world that are arrogant and say, well, that's not me. But, I, but what I discovered was that actually the parts that we dissociate oneself from, in particular situations, they are, they are all useful to us and, and we're missing them. So uh, what I discovered was that one needs to reclaim to be whole, one needs to reclaim these parts uh, that one has dissociated from um, to oneself, one part after the other. And so um, that is the, the little tool that I developed in what I call the money work, a process for reclaiming one part to oneself after the other. And this is what I use, what has to be used when one has problems with people in one's field uh, and things show up in one's initiative, I say, well, you know, how am I responsible for this as source? How is this happening in my field? And then I say, well, it must be something that I'm not conscious of, a projection that I'm making on other people um, that I need to reclaim. So I, f I, I look and try and find out what is it then, and then I reclaim it to myself, and, and then it's resolved. And then things will automatically be changed for the people in my field and for the whole of the, whole of the initiative itself. So if you're interested, I can give an example of myself. Please. So uh, I had a meeting of my community several years ago in Hungary. And, and some of the key people in my field left the meeting early, which for me was a complete, you know, no, no. Um, the son of, of my, you know, a key person in Hungary ha had a, a, a wedding and the whole group, Hungarian group left me. And I was shocked and, and thought, you know, I really don't, they're not trustworthy. That was my um, anymore. Um, I, I was deeply sort of touched emotionally uh, in the evening they left and thought, you know, how, how can I trust these people anymore? And then I, you know, working with my own process, I said to myself, well, you know, I'm projecting onto them that they are not trustworthy. So I must look at this part in myself. And what I said to myself is, I don't trust myself and I said I'm not trustworthy and then I said you know there's this part of me which is really not trustworthy I don't trust myself 
And then I said, you know, you, you know my process, Roni. I said, I don't trust myself and it's okay. It's a, I give myself permission not to trust myself. And then I said, well, it, it's okay not to be trustworthy. And it's, a, it's actually good to not be trustworthy. I don't trust myself and it's good. And immediately I came to peace with that. And I, I you know, with my own process, um, it didn't take me very long. I said, I don't trust myself. This is really funny. Uh, this is really good. And I realized, you know, being a source of things, it's really good not to trust yourself most of the time because you're in doubt most of the time. <laughs> and it's really important not to be able to trust yourself until you really can trust yourself with something because you're going to be in doubt most of the time. I, I tell my people 80% of the time, probably, you don't know the next step. Don't trust yourself until you're ready. And, and so I said, well, you know, I don't trust myself. It's really good. I don't trust myself. And, and that changes, you know, I, I, you know, the people in my community don't need to trust themselves. They don't need to trust me. Uh, they can challenge me. And it you can imagine that it changes the whole environment now. Yes. If I if I insist that everybody must trust me because I'm the source, it would be ridiculous. So that's an example of how I use I use this process to advance and makes a difference. This is great. Thank you very much for your sharing. Um, uh, our time is up for this format. Uh, we should oh. continue this conversation, Peter, at the later stage. Um, and I hope that many of the viewers uh, got some of the inspiration. Uh, I mentioned this little book earlier, and I will now switch on the ticker already, where you can, dear viewers, um, <coughs> excuse me, have a look at uh, Peter's work on his blog, but also um, there is a website, The Little Red Book, about source, uh, about this book. And there is a new book coming out soon, Work With Source. Uh, all the websites are on the ticker and will be in the description of this video. So I'm coming to an end, Peter, unfortunately already. I'm looking forward to meeting you soon. But I won't close before asking you, how was this for you? How are you feeling? Thank you, Rene. The time has flown. I can't believe this is uh, 30 minutes already. It feels like five, but it's great. And thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to share um, something which is uh, so important uh, to me and look forward to meeting you again. I think we can talk a lot longer, probably a, an hour or two, <laughs> without any problem at all on this subject and others. So uh, thank you very much. Peter, thank you very much. Um, uh, hang on, stay there for a moment. I'll close the recording now. Dear viewers, thank you for watching. Hope you subscribe and bye-bye.